Okay, so the fire detection system has got three subsystems. The engines, which actually are split up into two subsystems themselves. The APU and the main landing gear wheel wells. The three systems all have sensitive devices or detectors that are connected through electrical circuits to provide the warning, caution and status uh, displays. And they will also cause a fire bell or a voice message to be generated whenever there's an overheat condition. OK, fire extinguishing. So the fire extinguishing system, we've got two engine fire bottles, one APU fire bottle plus a portable fire bottle inside the uh, cabin. The engine and APU containers are connected to electrical circuits that show when the containers are armed and then uh, let the fire extinguisher come out of the bottle when you push the button. Electrical circuits are used to do a test on the engine and APU fire extinguishing systems to make sure they work properly. And obviously the portable fire extinguisher is just standalone. It's filled with halon and that's inside the flight compartment. Uh, here we can see a basic block diagram of the whole system altogether. And what I just want to point out to you now, so down the left hand side of the picture, you can see all our detectors or sensing elements and they feed into individual control units. So there's a control unit for every sort of section. So we've got one for the left engine, one for the right engine and one for the left engine uh, exhaust nozzle and pylon area. So I said that the engines are sp split into two subsystems. These are the two subsystems. Basically, you've got zone A and zone B. We'll look at that more in detail in a minute. So you've got a detector unit for that, one for each engine. Then you've got a detector unit for the APU or a control unit for the APU and one for the main landing gear uh, wheel well. The engine fire detection system um, comprises of two separate McGraw Edison continuous wire, and wire, wire sensing systems, one for each engine, which provide visual and oral warnings when there's a fire detected. The actual extinguishing system for the engine, there's two water kiddie fire X bottles, one for each of the engines, manually activated from the flight deck, and you can discharge either bottle into either engine. Um, the two, so the two engine bottles are interconnected so that they can be used on either engine or both bottles can be used on one engine. Depends on the situation. The engine has been divided into two zones, as we said earlier. The area within the outer cowling and around the service area of the engine and under the leading edge of the combustor section, that's des designated as zone A. If a fire is detected in zone A, we can put the fire out using the engine fire extinguishing system. The area behind the aft um, engine mount ring is designated as zone B, and the fire extinguishing system doesn't work in that area. So actually you get a different warning as well to avoid confusion for the crew. So one's a fire warning and the other one's an overheat warning. <clears throat> So an overheat in zone B, um, as well as in the pylon area, is detected by a separate unit. It's detected by the engine jet pipe stroke pylon overheat detection system. And an overheat in this area can only be dealt with by reducing engine power. The fire extinguishing system doesn't work in this area. It, doesn't, it, it, it won't reach it. So if an engine fire is detected, so this is a zone A fire, if an engine fire is detected, you will get a master warning uh, light lights up, you'll get a fire bell sounding and the engine fire push lights. There's the appropriate one. There's two of them, one for the left engine, one for the one for the right engine. The engine fire push lights will illuminate and the crew action now will be to push that engine fire push light for the appropriate one. And that will have do several things. Number one, it will arm the fire bottles for that engine. Number two, it will cause the engine to shut down because the fuel will be shut off, plus the hydraulics 
will be shut off and the engine generator will be taken offline and the engine bleed system will shut down. And then to discharge the bottle, you would then push the bottle A or bottle uh, B uh, push button. And in fact, once you've pushed the engine fire push button, those two green uh, bottle armed lights will, bottle one, bottle two lights will light up, both of them, one on each side of the glare shield. They will both light up and, and um, the crew can discharge both or either of them into the, uh, into the engine. When the, the fire bottles will not discharge until you've armed them by pushing the fire push button, the appropriate one. Okay, we're talking about zone A detection right now. Okay, not zone B, zone A. So each engine has two sensing elements, an engine combustion zone sensing element, which is actually physically made up of two parts, and a zone A pylon sensing element, which covers the service combustor section and exit shroud around the pneumatic lines to the pylon of the engine in, in the zone A bit. And although they are in three segments, both loops are set to trip at uh, 332 degrees C in a maximum zone temperature of 232 degrees C. So it does get hot, it's the engine, it's going to get hot in that area. The maximum temperature that that, would, that zone would ever get to under normal conditions is 232 degrees C. The fire um, trip point is, is set at 100 degrees higher than that roughly at 330 degrees C. So if it gets that hot in that zone, that's an abnormal hot, abnormally hot. So at that point, it would then trip. What the pictures also show here is a location of the fire detection control units, which are basically in the uh, right hand side console. And you can see there one of the uh, pylon zone, um, zone A pylon elements. So the sensing elements form a loop with the fire detection unit. And this circuit in reality has actually an infinite number of resistors to ground through the insulator connected in parallel. So the system will still effectively work with a break in the loop. Um, if it was literally severed, the bit that's still connected to the detector will still work, provided there's no low resistance or short circuit to ground at where the break point is. And we'll look at um, that later because the system can, um, the detector unit can differentiate between a short circuit and basically a fire. When, when the heat increases, the resistance drops, um, but only to a certain point. So it does differentiate the difference between a fire situation and a short circuit, which would be a failure. So the sensor elements a coax cable with an inner conductor, which is connected to the fire detection unit, an insulator part, and then an outer part, the outer, the outer tube. The outer tube is permanently grounded. And the detector unit is, is constantly monitoring the resistance between the inner and the outer. And the inner, um, or the insulator, in inverted commas, is basically a semiconductor material whose resistance changes and decreases as it gets hotter. And the detector unit is constantly monitoring that resistance. And when it reaches the trip threshold, it will issue um, <clears throat> the fire warning. Each engine has got its own fire detection unit then, which monitors that loop resistance. And when that resistance reaches its trip level, it produces the fire warning output. So you'll get the red master warning light, the fire push button will light up, the red one, um, the fire bell will sound, and you'll get the red ICAS message left or right engine fire. Inside the detector unit, there are actually two comparators, the true fire and a warning failure. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So here we can see a basic schematic as to what's going on. So we can see our three sinks and elements. This is all for this is purely for zone A, okay? So we've got the three sinks and elements, but as far as the detection unit's concerned, that's they're all treated as one single loop. 
and you'll see inside the fire detector unit there's a true fire comparator and a warning failure comparator. So as we said earlier on, the system can differentiate between a fire condition and a short circuit, which would, be, which would be an indication of a failed detector. So if we get an overheat condition going on within the engine, within that zone A, the temperature goes up to 330 odd degrees C, <clears throat> the resistance of the elements is going to drop to that critical threshold and the detector unit will then issue to the to the DCU the fire signal and you get all your bells and whistles lighting up. And at the same time it will also send an inhibit signal to the warning circuit so the crew are not presented with sort of conflicting uh, uh, signals you know with a fire and also a failure because that would be a bit confusing. So when there's a fire, a real fire situation, the warning circuit is inhibited. On the warning side of things, if we have a short circuit, that will be, a cons that will be considered to be a failed detector. <clears throat> and the warning comparator will issue a fail signal to the DCU and you'll get all your fail messages. And at the same time, it sends an inhibit signal to the fire uh, comparator. So you're not going to get any fire warnings when there's a a failure situation going on. Now we can test both the ability of the system to detect a fire and we can also test the ability of the system to, to detect a failure. So on the, uh, there's, a, there's a, um, a miscellaneous test warning um, panel and we've got a fire detection um, test switch and uh, it's, it's actually three positions, there's warning, like, and then a middle position and then a fail position. If we put it to the warning position, we generate a fire warning test relay and that puts um, through a resistor a signal to ground. And that resistor is basically si simulating the same resistance that you would get if there was a, um, uh, a real live fire. The true fire comparator will then see that as a fire and it will issue all the bells and whistles and it will issue all the signals as if there was a real fire through the to the DCUs and of course at the same time when it does that it will inhibit the uh, warning the fail warning side of the circuit so as far as a true comparator is concerned when we're testing it it doesn't know we're testing it I mean it doesn't know that it's a test it just sees the resultant res uh, resistance value as a real fire when we put the test switch to the fail position, we energize another relay. This is the fault test relay. And what you can see there, it just puts a signal directly to ground, to simulate a short circuit. And so this time the warning fail comparator will see that. It's going to issue the failure, all the failure messages, and it's going to send a signal to inhibit the fire, the true fire uh, signal that will be inhibited. Um, so again, the fire detection unit just thinks it's a real failure situation. So what we were talking about just now was the zone A area. Um, so the indication of a fire in zone A is you get the fire bell sound in, master warning lights, the red fire push button lights up and you get the red ICAS messages engine 1, engine 2 fire. Zone B is an overheat that is considered to be the jet pipe overheat so it covers the jet pipe area, but also the pylon area actually, but inside on the airframe side of the pylon rather than the engine side of the pylon. <clears throat> so that's zone B, but you get a single message, jet pipe overheat. Master warning lights will light up again. The fire push buttons don't light up because remember the fire extinguisher is not gonna have any effect on zone B. So you get a jet pipe overheat voice message, jet pipe overheat, red warning message, the master red warning, uh, master caution, uh, master warning lights flash, <clears throat> no bell, no fire bell, don't want to confuse the crew with, and, and you know, and get them to discharge a fire bottle because we know that that won't do any good. So the zone B, um, the zone B areas covers a darker shaded area in the picture there, so it includes the jet pipe area plus the uh, airframe part of the pylon area. Monitored by two jet pipe stroke pylon overheat detection control units, one for each side, and they're located in the cockpit behind the uh, co-pilot seat. So
So in this picture, we can just see the locations of the two sensing elements related to the zone B area. So you've got an, uh, an element around the jet pipe area and then a separate element within the uh, airframe side of the pylon. So the jet pipe detection, uh, overheat detection system works in exactly the same way as the engine one. You've got the same principle of operation for the sensors. The temperature threshold is um, a little bit lower because we're not expecting the area to get um, particularly hot um, in that uh, zone. So the temperature, the temperature uh, trip points are different. <clears throat> uh, but internally, um, you've got a fire or an overheat warning comparator. You've got a fail warning comparator. Uh, and internally, the actual detector units are working in the um, same way. Messages we get then, we get a left or right jet pipe overheat red message. We get the voice message jet pipe overheat. And in the event of a failure of, the, of a uh, detector or a sensor, then you get the caution message jet pipe overheat fail left or right hand side. Moving on to the APU system now, so very similar to the engine system, uses the same type of uh, sensing element, um, which uh, is inside the APU compartment that gives us our um, visual and oral warnings for fires. So if the components we have then, we've got the APU fire push light, similar type of thing to the engine one. We've got the test panel, we've got our ICAST displays, We've got the fire sensing element and an APU detection control unit. And also not listed there is the APU fire bottle uh, push to discharge uh, switch. So the APU fire sensing element, it's a similar design to the engine one, works on the same principle. It's just one single element though that's wrapped around inside the APU enclosure. Uh, the trip point is 232 degrees C. The APU detector control unit works in a very similar way to the engine one that we talked about before and the jet pipe overheat one. Uh, so it's just internally you've got the true fire comparator, the warning fail comparator. Um, so if there's a short circuit, it's an indication of a failure. It releases the fail signal to the DCU and inhibits the fire warning. Uh, if there's a real fire, then it releases the fire signal to the DCU and inhibits the uh, failure warning circuits. Um, the testing is in, done in the same way from the same panel. So very, very similar to the uh, um, engine. The only other difference with the APU system as a whole is that if there's an APU fire detected, then the APU automatically shuts down. Uh, the, fire, the, the crew still have to fire the fire bottle manually if they want to, but if there's an APU fire, it will shut down the APU automatically. If you if um, if there's a fire, the APU fire push button illuminates, and by pushing that button, the APU will shut down if it hasn't done already, and that will also arm the bottle. Okay, so this is the whole picture, and there's just a few things I want to highlight to you in this picture. Now on the left hand side of the picture, as you look at it, you can see all the sensor elements and the detector units, and we know what's going on inside there. We've already covered it. So that we know that when there's an engine fire, for example, the, um, the detector unit will release the fire signal, sending it to the DCUs. The DCUs will now illuminate the, the relevant engine fire push or APU fire push button which we can see if we just take the top one as an example, which is a left-hand engine fire one as an example, you can see there then you've got the fire push button, um, the DCU, the lamp driver unit, and a power supply coming into the actual switch, the switch light. So the switch light will illuminate when the lamp driver unit provides a ground signal, and the ground signal will be provided by the LDU once it gets an instruction from the DCU. We now have to push that fire button to arm the system. Now, if we just take the top one as an example, so it's a left-hand engine fire as an example. So we now push 
the fire push button. <clears throat> so we can see there we've got a power supply from the emergency bus and it says fire extinguisher number one left engine on the top set of contacts. So we push that um, fire push button in, it's going to close those sw switch contacts and send the power from the emergency bus to the next step, which will be to illuminate the fire bottle armed push to discharge lights. And remember it said, we said it will illuminate them both because we got two shots at putting the uh, fire out. <clears throat> we'll just look at one so we don't confuse ourselves. So the, we'll look at the top one because it's easier to follow. So the power from the emergency bars then comes from the fire push switch light. It comes along to the green fire bottle armed push to discharge light. And if you follow it through to the very end of the picture, it passes through a pressure switch. So as long as the pressure in the fire bottle is good, which is how the pressure switch is drawn in the picture, the pressure is good, then there's a ground signal and it, and it allows that light to illuminate in the switch. So that armed light will now light up. If we push that armed switch, then it will make complete a circuit from the emergency buzz to the squibs and boom, the fire bottles will discharge. Once the fire bottles has, or the fire bottle has discharged, the, low, the, the bottle will now be in a low pressure situation. So that ground signal that was used to illuminate the arm light is going to be removed and that, that light will extinguish and the leaving the other light still illuminated as long as we haven't pushed that button as well so it gives the crew you know an idea of what what they're going to push next so they push one button boom fire bottle goes pressure discharges that green light will now extinguish and there's another green light on the other side now if we want to we can we can operate that if we push it boom it fires the other squib on the other bottle the bottle discharges the low pressure uh, switch will now operate because <clears throat> the bottle contents have gone and then that uh, arm light will now disappear as well and also once we get into a low pressure condition um, we get some cast messages which we'll look at later just to confirm We're going to look at the main landing gear bay overheat detection system now. So that gives an indication in the cockpit of an overheat in the main landing gear uh, wheel well. This condition is most likely to happen if you've got an overheated brake. Um, so what we've got, uh, we've got our ice cast displays that generate the main landing gear overheat uh, warning message or uh, a fail message as appropriate. We've got the main landing gear bay overheat test panel. So it's a different panel from the FireX uh, monitoring test panel that we had a look at before. It's, it's on the landing gear. Select a lever panel. Two sensing elements, one in each landing gear wheel well and a main landing gear bay overheat detection control unit. Okay, what have we got? So we've got sensing element. There's one sensing element attached to the top of each wheel bin. These wheel bins are Kevlar bins that you can take out and they're there to contain any sort of flaying bits of rubber from the tires, stop them damaging the components inside the wheel well. So the sensing element principle works in the same way as the engine and the APUs uh, ones do. We've got a detector control unit which is in the same place as where the APU one is and the left and right engine ones are and by the way all of those control units are all the same <clears throat> and power supply for the control unit comes from the uh, battery bus <clears throat> so the cast messages we get then red warning message main landing gear bay overheat that'll be coming on at the same time with a gear bay overheat voice message if the system fails, um, if the detection system fails, you get an overheat fail caution message. Doesn't tell you whether it's the left hand or right hand side, doesn't matter. Um, in reality, those bays are kind of joined together anyway. 
and the crew action would be to put the gear down that's the only thing they can really do and you wouldn't put obviously just the left gear down or whatever so you put all the gear down and uh, so there's, there's no real need to tell the crew whether it's the left or right hand side So the sensing elements are similar to the engine and APU. Obviously, the, the detector control unit's the same. Um, obviously, through pin programming, it will know whether it is a main landing gear well or an APU one or an engine one. Uh, the set, the trip temperatures are different, so a little bit lower. You, you, it doesn't, it shouldn't normally get hot in the main landing gear bay. So it's set to quite a low temperature, really, 160 degrees C. Um, and then you generate the main landing gear bay overheat message on the ICAS and the voice message and along with the triple triple chime master warning lights um, uh, no fire extinguishing system um, and uh, yeah you're good to go so the fire extinguishing system so we're talking about zone A again now okay um, <clears throat> it's a um, there's two fire bottles that we can use to go into either both or, or, or different engines. And basically it's a Halon 1301, it's extinguishant, pressurized with nitrogen to act as the propellant. The system is armed and activated manually from the flight, back, uh, flight deck. Um, so you have to push the armed, uh, you have to push the fire push button to arm it, and then you push the discharge button to discharge it. You've got to do it in that order. So when a fire is being detected and, it, and the alarm goes off, the respective left or right engine fire push light will illuminate, as we saw from that previous schematic. <clears throat> when you push that button, you know from the previous schematic that the fire bottles are now armed. But also when you push that fire push button, um, the engine firewall fuel shut off valve will shut, and therefore the engine is going to sh shut down. Uh, the engine hydraulic shutoff valve is shut off, so it stops the hydraulic fluid going to the uh, engine driven pump. The 10th stage bleed valve will close, the 14th stage bleed valve will close, and uh, the ignition will be switched off. The, it, there's a relay that will energize and it disables the ignition. So once you've pushed the engine fire push light, so the engine shuts down, everything shuts down, the bleed sh shuts off and everything. Um, the fire bottles will arm. So both bottle one and the bottle two, uh, bottle one armed, bottle two armed, push to discharge lights will now illuminate. So there's one on the left hand side of the um, glare shield, one on the right hand side, but they will both illuminate <clears throat> because the crew have got two shots of putting the fire out using the two bottles. So by pushing the fire push, the red one, pushing the fire push switch, you've armed two squibs, one on each bottle, so that if you push those buttons now, the bottle will discharge into the left or the right engine. The engine fire bottles, there are two of them, remember they're in the after equipment bay just under the APU enclosure. Um, each bottle has got a 125 cubic inch, cubic inch spherical container, two uh, electrically operated discharge ports with the two squibs on, and a thermal discharge port, and also a manual gauge. Bottles are charged with Halon 1301, pressurized with nitrogen at 600 to 625 psi. So the left and right ports are operated by explosive squibs that are electrically activated from the flight deck when you push the discharge uh, switch. And each port contains a squib which has got dual firing cartridges just for redundancy. When fired, a bullet penetrates a frangible disc which allows the contents of the bottle to be discharged. Now there's a third port on the bottle which is the thermal discharge port. That will operate when the bottle pressure exceeds 1400 PSI. 
and since it's assumed that this pressure will only be achieved if there is a fire in the actual area where the bottle is, the thermal discharge port discharges directly into the area of the fire bottle installation, so in other words into the aft equipment bay. So if there was a fire, hopefully it would actually put it out. So there's a, <clears throat> there's a physical gauge on the bottle, displays a bottle pressure in the range of 0 through to 1500 psi. Um, each bottle, as we know, contains a pressure switch, uh, which operates at 275 psi to indicate the bottle pressure is uh, low for effective use. Um, obviously, the fire bottles are the one-shot type, i.e. you can only discharge them once, and um, a discharge bottle has to be removed and replaced with a fully charged one. There's no way of charging it up or recharging it in situ. So here's a kind of picture summarizing everything. So um, if you have an engine fire, you'll get the left or right engine fire push light illuminate. <clears throat> so you push that. That will then illuminate the both, the bottle one, two armed push to discharge lights, as long as the pressure in the bottle is good. And then you fire the bottle. Hopefully it puts the fire out. Uh, and if it does, then happy days. Um, and what you can then do is to disarm the system, you then push the fire push light again to disarm it. And now you've got one engine shut down because of a fire, the other engine's running, but now you've still got protection on the other engine if you need it. Okay, a couple of more cast messages we haven't mentioned yet. So engine one, engine two, bottle low. That's triggered by the, the pressure switch. So if the fire bottle pressure is below 275 PSI. So obviously that's going to come on once you've discharged the uh, fire bottle. So it's kind of a confidence thing as well. So you, 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 you push the button and then um, if that message comes on, you know it's definitely discharged itself. The other message, which is an advisory message, it says squib OK. Left or right engine squib OK, squib 1 OK, squib 2 OK. Um, the only time you'll see this is um, is um, when you do the test. If you do the bottle test, you'll get a, a green advisory message, bottle one test, uh, or a left engine squib one and squib two, OK. <clears throat> Okay, APU extinguishing. So we've just got one bottle for the APU, just one shot. It's a, it's a halon bottle again with nitrogen as the extinguishant. Um, and so what we have then components wise, we've got the APU fire push light, the red one, the APU bottle arm push to discharge light, the green one. They're both on the right hand side of the uh, glare shield. Obviously we've got our ICAST displays for the messages. And we got the FireX monitor test panel to test the uh, system like we did on the engines. <clears throat> and the APU fire extinguish fire, uh, the APU fire bottle itself. So the APU fire push light and the red light that comes on when the APU fire detector detects a real fire. And of course, the APU, as we said, automatically will shut down when there's a real fire. <clears throat> which, um, by the way, when you test the system, um, we, what we don't want to do is for the APU to shut down just because we've done a test. So when you do the fire test, um, a, a relay will operate, which will inhibit the APU from shutting down. So the APU won't shut down if you test it. <clears throat> so the push button illuminates um, so when you when you push the um, APU fire push button to arm the bottle, uh, the APU will shut down if it hasn't already shut down. And at that stage, the green bottle arm to push to discharge light will illuminate as long as the bottle pressure is good, more than 275 psi. <clears throat> if the APU fire bu push button is selected even if it's not illuminated, um, the, the APU will shut down. I think we've covered everything we need to mention from how it works 
for this picture. But what I will just highlight here then once again is you can see the output coming from the APU fire detector unit that, that will illuminate the APU fire push button <clears throat> when there's a fire um, and also go along via that diode to the APU shutoff relay to cause the APU to shut down. But you'll notice that um, it has to pass through that APU warning test relay. And when you do the test, that test relay energizes and that stops the output from the detector unit from causing the APU to shut down when we're testing it. We're almost there now, just a couple of loose ends to tidy up. So smoke detection, um, there is a smoke detector in the cargo bay. Um, that gets power from uh, 28 volt DC buzz number two to generate a cargo smoke message. The smoke detector is an ionization type of smoke detector and you'll find a test button on the call enunciator panel. We'll look, we'll look at it on the uh, next slide. So there's a press test switch on the, or which provides a ground discrete signal to the detector unit. That simulates a smoke condition within the detector unit and sends the smoke signal to the DCU, which will then generate our smoke in the toilet message, because there's, there's one in there, there's a smoke detector in the toilet as well, and smoke in the baggage bay message, along with the voice message smoke. Here we can see the uh, call enunciator panel and on there there's the smoke uh, test switch and that's on the center pedestal towards the back. <clears throat> 